Cell culture is important to understand as it differs from the production of microbes via fermentation. Although some principles are transferable, there are many differences in both processes and products from cell culture. In this lecture, we'll be going over the history, cell types, and various ways to grow mammalian cells. The first examples of cell culture were in the late 1800s with Sidney Ringer, who, building on the work of others, investigated what was called extra vital effects on frog hearts using saline and other nutrients. Other work includes Rowe's work on embryonic chick cells and the work of Carroll, who developed a flask for culture called the D-flask, which is the predecessor of the modern T-flask. In the 1930s, antibiotics started being used in more advanced cell culture media, with Earl developing media for growth of mouse fibroblasts. In 1951, Gay's team isolated cells from Henrietta Lacks, a patient at Johns Hopkins who eventually succumbed to ovarian cancer. Her cells, which were isolated and later called HeLa, proved to be robust in growth and are still used today. These cells made it possible to mass produce the polio vaccine and many other advances. In the early 1960s, Leonard Hayflick established what would be known as the Hayflick limit, which acknowledges normal cells have a finite lifetime, unlike cancer cells like HeLa, which are immortal. Other work included development of media by Earl, Eagle, and Ham, as well as the development of the Chinese hamster ovary, or Cho cell line, which is now the major cell line for production of biological medicines. In the late 70s, Kohler and Milstein developed monoclonal antibodies, which we will talk about later in the presentation. Recombinant tissue plasminogen activator, or TPA, a treatment for stroke and other proteins were expressed in Cho cells, and antibodies derived from mice were humanized for use in patients. In addition, transient transfection, which we'll also talk about, was established. As shown in the figure here, large-scale production of monoclonal antibodies and other therapeutic proteins at scales up to 20,000 liters was also established. Why do we use cell culture? Cell production is typically much more expensive than growing microbial cells, and these cells grow much slower, as we will see. The main advantage is mammalian cells have cellular machinery for proper post-translational modifications, including protein folding and glycosylation. In many cases, proteins such as antibodies cannot be made in microbial cells and mammalian cells have to be used. There are many differences between microbial and mammalian growth. The scale of mammalian culture is generally less, with most runs now being performed in a max of 2,000 liters in single-use bioreactors. The biggest difference is the doubling time which can be 20 times slower or more for mammalian cells. The split ratio, or how dilute the cells are when scaling, is higher for microbial cells since they grow faster. As would be expected, aeration rates are much lower for mammalian cells since they don't need as much oxygen. Cell density for mammalian cells is also lower as these cells are generally much bigger than bacteria or fungal cells. With the exception of primary cells, which are used mainly in research, all mammalian cells used in biomanufacturing are immortalized cells. Originally, cells were grown adherently, meaning they grew attached to the bottom of a plate or flask, but now lines have been adapted to grow in suspension, which increases the total number of cells per volume. There are a number of cell lines used in biomanufacturing, including hybridoma lines, which produce monoclonal antibodies. Other notable lines include NS0 cells, which are used to generate monoclonals, as we will see. Other cell lines include CHO cells, which we discussed and is shown in the image, as well as HEK cell lines, which along with BHK and PERS-C6 cells are used for recombinant protein production. Finally, VIRO cells are used in virus production for vaccines. As mentioned earlier, Cho cell lines are the most commonly used in biomanufacturing operations. As shown on the table here, 
There are a number of different products made, including antibody drugs to treat cancer and arthritis, as well as drugs used to treat infertility, hemophilia, and certain diseases. There are a wide range of products produced, including hormones, clotting factors, enzymes, vaccines, antibodies, and other proteins. To grow mammalian cells, specific conditions are required, including temperature around 37 C and 5 to 10 percent CO2. Growth at lower temperature is possible, and CO2 serves as a counter buffer for control of pH. pH is usually maintained around pH 7 to 7.2. Another parameter to consider is osmolality, which is a measure of dissolved solids and should be around 300 to 360 milliosmoles per kilogram. Serum-free media is typically used to reduce use of animal products to support growth in the range of 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7 cells per milliliter. Glutamine is a major nutrient for many mammalian cells. Glutamine can supply both the carbon and nitrogen for the cell in up to 30% of the energy required. Glutamine synthetase enzyme is used as a selectable marker for production of recombinant protein in cells knocked out for this activity. Suspension cells can be grown using a variety of strategies, including batch, fed batch, and perfusion modes, while adherent cells have less options for production. Adherent cells instead can be grown on a variety of surfaces, including tea flask and roller bottles, microcarriers, and other scaffolds as shown allow for suspension growth by giving the cells a surface to attach to that is free floating. There are a variety of systems that are used to produce mammalian cells. These include stirred tank reactors, whey bioreactors shown here, polyfiber systems, roller bottles, and other types of bioreactors. Roller bottles, as the name suggests, roll in place. The bottles are filled with a small amount of media and laid on their side. The rolling is required in order to wet cells coated around the inside of the bottle. This is a relatively simple way to grow cells and although labor intensive is used extensively in vaccine production. The hollow fiber system consists of a cartridge and pump that pumps media into a cartridge membrane filled with cells. The cells grow inside the cartridge and product is moved through the filter and collected in a separate tank. The cells get packed at a high density and this is thought to improve productivity. The packed bed bioreactor system uses discs that cells adhere to and grow in place. Media can be perfused in and product removed for a semi-continuous system. Stirred tank reactors are the most common type of bioreactor and are used extensively in biomanufacturing. There are both stainless steel and single-use systems at different volumes. Like microbial fermenters, there is a shaft inside the tank equipped with impellers that rotate to mix media and break up gas bubbles introduced into the system via a gas sparger. There are two main ways to create cell lines that express recombinant proteins, stable lines and transient lines. Stable lines, as the name suggests, stably produce gene products where the DNA encoding the protein is integrated into the chromosome of the organism. Stable cell lines typically result in higher yields, up to 10 grams per liter or more, and don't need added DNA to work. However, the lines can take months to generate at considerable expense, so are not implemented universally. Transient lines express DNA from a plasmid that is transiently transfected into the cells. This type of expression is quick to perform, but the expression is short-lived and product yields are lower, although newer systems get into the gram per liter level now, as seen in the attached figures. Stable cell lines have to have genes integrated into chromosomal DNA in order to work. Genes are inserted along with a selectable marker so only cells with a gene grow and other cells that don't have the plasmid can't grow. A variety of clones result and must be screened for the best producer. 
Cells can be selected using markers including neomycin, dihydrofolate reductase, or glutamine synthetase. The cells must be isolated as a single population of cells before moving forward to cell line characterization. Switching gears, antibodies are a major biopharmaceutical product made using mammalian cells. A comprehensive description is out of the scope of this presentation, but essentially there are five types of antibodies, with IgG being the most commonly produced in cell culture. Hybridomas are cell lines that secrete monoclonal antibodies. They are generated by first immunizing an animal such as a mouse and then titering until a response is observed. The mouse is then sacrificed and its spleen is used to extract B-cell splenocytes. These cells are fused with myeloma cells, a kind of cancer cell line. If fusion occurs, then a new cell line called a hybridoma is generated that is immortal like the cancer cell line and expresses the antibody of interest. The myeloma cells are selected against using a chemical that poisons those cells but hybridomas can survive in. The remaining B cells die because they are not immortalized cells and are subject to the Hayflick limit. After fusion, a mixture of cells is obtained, but a clonal cell line of just one type is desired. There are two methods employed to achieve this. One is limiting dilution, where cells are diluted to approximately one cell per well in 96 well cell culture plates and screened for the activity desired. This method can be problematic as multiple rounds of limiting dilution could be required to get a clonal line. A newer method employs a semi-solid auger that cells grow in as discrete colonies. These colonies are picked and then screened, which ends up being a more efficient way to achieve clonality of lines. Once a cell line of any type is grown, the cells must be counted and assessed for viability. Counting is achieved using a hemocytometer. The device has microscopic boxes that are used to count cells. The total volume of a box of 16 squares, as shown here, is 0.1 microliters. Counts are averaged, and a viability stain helps distinguish live from dead cells. When counting cells, a good rule of thumb is consistency. In this case, cells on the bottom and right edges of the 16 cells are not counted, while everything else is. The blue cells are dead and a total viability is determined after counting three different sets of 16 boxes. To get the total cells per milliliter, average the cells over several grids of 16 boxes, then multiply by the dilution factor and 10,000 to get cells per milliliter.